Welcome to our special webinar on the rising danger of nuclear war. This webinar is convened by an informal movement called uh, SHAKE, Saving Humanity and Planet Earth. Before we begin the seminar, the webinar proper, I would like to invite my colleague, one of the three conveners of SHAPE, Professor Richard Falk, to um, make an important announcement about the, this webinar. Richard, please. Uh, thank you, Chandra. Uh, we have very sad news that uh, Daniel Ellsberg's health forced him this morning uh, to withdraw from the webinar. He was um, unable to speak uh, coherently or audibly, and he suffered from a bad cold and exhaustion. Uh, he's been doing a great deal around the world the, this, these past weeks, uh, appearing in numerous venues trying his best to make use of the time that he has left given the very negative diagnosis of inoperable pancreatic cancer that he is suffering from. I spoke with his wife also this morning and she is convinced that this temporary uh, disabling uh, effect of his activity is uh, not really related to the underlying disease and that uh, she hopes that he'll be able to resume some uh, reduced but active uh, schedule in the weeks ahead. And we certainly hope so. And we thought, uh, under the circumstances uh, of concern that led us to organize this webinar around the theme of nuclear danger, that the responsible thing was to go ahead with the program in an altered, but we hope, a helpful way. And it's very fortunate that uh, Zia Mian, an old friend and a, a distinguished uh, expert on uh, nuclear issues and nuclear se and global security, long associated with Princeton University, where we were friends and colleagues over many years, and he has uh, agreed to uh, take Dan's place. He's been, as I have, in close touch with Dan in this period. So in a sense, while Dan isn't here physically, his spirit and our homage to him is very much at the core of our endeavor and in the spirit of what shape stands for. Let me turn it back to you, uh, Chandra, now. Thanks, Richard. So we are going to continue. And that is something which, um, as Richard just noted, would be in the spirit of uh, Dan Ellsberg's struggle his um, contribution all these decades to fighting for the truth, speaking truth to power. And uh, we decided to hold this webinar in recognition of that um, contribution of his. And I think it's only right that we continue with this webinar and it's good that uh, Dr. Zia Mian has agreed to speak. Uh, 
And uh, he was going to be the respondent, but now he has taken on a slightly different role. But it is nonetheless the sort of role which would uh, ensure that uh, we continue to dialogue with people, with all those who have registered, with others, on this very important issue of the rising danger of nuclear war. Shall I now begin by introducing Dr. Zia Mian? As you have seen the write-up on him, the post uh, that we have distributed, and some of you will be aware of the work he has done. He's, uh, he's a distinguished physicist with Princeton University. He is, I think, uh, part of this uh, group in Princeton associated with attempts to illuminate the public about the nuclear challenge. And he has been working on disarmament, he's working on proliferation, on ways of controlling uh, nuclear weapons. He has got a book that is co-authored on uh, the making of the bomb. He's um, also written a number of other articles. I'm told that he has also produced a couple of documentaries on uh, issues of peace and security in South Asia. So he has got a, a record that we can all be proud of. I'm glad that uh, through the efforts of Richard, a friend of his, uh, he has agreed to play this slightly modified role this um, evening, this morning for us, slightly modified role that you will play. And um, I'd be very happy to hand over the microphone to him. Zia? Thank you. Um, Please. Um, can someone let me know that they can see my slide? Yes, I can see it. I can see it Thank also. You. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, um, Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Chandra. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Um, I was hoping, like all of us, to be able to be uh, able to be in conversation with uh, our dear friend and uh, guide on nuclear weapons issues for such a long time, Daniel Ellsberg, this evening. And it's very sad that. Uh, his health doesn't permit him to join us, but I hope that we can uh, have a conversation in his spirit. And so I have a few introductory remarks and then I hope that we can have uh, a response from Richard and, and a conversation uh, among our group today. So um, let me begin by making uh, three observations of things that uh, I think that I have learned in particular from um, Daniel Ellsberg's work and thinking activism and contribution to the nuclear weapons debate, and then uh, make some remarks about um, how I see some of these things playing out today and the uh, politics of nuclear weapons in the situation we find ourselves in and um, perhaps an observation or two about a path forward. So um, one of the things that um, Daniel Ellsberg taught us at a very, very um, early stage in um, the nuclear arms race after World War II um, is about how to think about nuclear weapons when they're not being used in war. Because so much of our conversations nuclear weapons have been about 
Hiroshima and Nagasaki and uh, the catastrophic consequences of the use of nuclear weapons in wartime. And Daniel um, has written how his first um, encounter with uh, the idea of nuclear weapons came at a very young age, even before the atomic bomb had been used in Hiroshima in, in a class that he was taking as a student in school. Um, but when he began his career in thinking about national security politics and strategy, and he was one of the pioneers of how to think about human behavior in political settings. Um, and as an economist and um, later as a strategist, and he gave a very, very important lecture in the late 1950s, um, which was later published by the Rand Corporation, um, which I commend to you on the theory and practice of blackmail with specific reference to the threat to use nuclear weapons. And you have to remember that in 1959, um, we are well past Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it's worth remembering in this specific instance, the United States was not only the first country to use a nuclear weapon in wartime with the destruction of Hiroshima, uh, it was also the first country to threaten the use of nuclear weapons. The first threat to use nuclear weapons explicitly was made by President Truman in the statement he made after the bombing of Hiroshima in a famous uh, statement from the White House, threatening a reign of ruin upon Japan, the like of which had never been seen in the history of the world if the Japanese did not surrender. And it was well understood that this was meant more use of uh, nuclear weapons against Japan. But, um, and the United States threatened the use of nuclear weapons publicly during the Korean War uh, in the early 1950s. And so in thinking about these issues about the threat and use of nuclear weapons and the how they fit into statecraft and politics. In his lecture from 1959, Daniel called our attention to the political use of nuclear weapons as an instrument of um, state policy and the practice of deterrence. And he noted that this preeminent use of nuclear weapons as political instruments um, as tools of policy is amenable to not just expansionist powers, but to status quo powers. And in our present situation, you know, one can see that being played out. But in his famous formulation of this, Dan said, call it blackmail, it, call it blackmail, call it deterrence, call both coercion, the art of influencing the behavior of others by threats. And that with nuclear weapons, we are dealing with threats of force. And so, this idea that nuclear weapons serve this role as a continuous threat, um, which is to be manipulated in various ways by um, states and their leaders uh, in the context of crises and in between crises is something that Daniel was, was key in, in bringing our attention to. The second thing that uh, I think that one can learn from uh, reflecting on Daniel's contributions was this astonishing book that it's contained in this astonishing book that he wrote, The Doomsday Machine, The Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner. And that describes his very long career in thinking about and being involved in US nuclear war planning and US strategy. And in particular, he writes at the beginning of The Doomsday Machine how in the spring of 1961, um, at the age of uh, barely 30, um, he was working in the White House for President Kennedy and he had drafted a letter for President Kennedy to send to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the senior most military leadership in the United States, asking a very simple question, uh, which Dan had proposed that the president ask. And the question was this, how many people would die as a consequence of the US nuclear war plan? And I want to be clear, the question was not how many people would die in a nuclear war? The question was how many people would die as a consequence of the US nuclear war plan? And the answer that came back within a week to Dan's surprise um, was uh, of the order of 325 million people. 
And it came back as this chart, this graph that Dan reproduced from memory in the Doomsday Machine. And Dan's surprise at this answer of 365 million coming back to the president within a week was that he had not imagined that the military knew the answer to this question. He had assumed they would have to go work it out or admit that they didn't know the answer. And when the answer came back that the answer, it was 325 million, he wrote a second letter on behalf of President Kennedy. And that was a follow-up question, which is how many people would die from the US nuclear war plan more broadly than just in direct adversary states? And the answer that came back was 600 million people. Because what the military added to the original number was the additional 100 million deaths in Eastern Europe, in Western Europe, and in states bordering the Soviet Union and China. And as I said, this did not include the US deaths from um, a possible Soviet counter-strike with their nuclear weapons. And in his book, The Doomsday Machine, Daniel says that it was seeing this chart that made him realize that his life's purpose was to prevent such a plan ever being carried out. And he argued that the existence of such a plan in and of itself was an evil thing. And the third takeaway that I have from Daniel Ellsberg's writing was that Dan concludes his book with the observation that in his judgment, human beings as a species and as the way in which we have organized our communities and our world into nation states and ideas of nationalism and the use of force and war, he says, we are not a species to be trusted with nuclear weapons. And what my version of this is um, what the German philosopher Gunther Anders called the Promethean discrepancy, that this is the gap between our ability to produce the end of the world and our ability to imagine this end, to represent it and to control it. We have created something that is beyond our capacity to manage. And this is why he says that we are not a species that can be trusted with nuclear weapons. We can make them, but we can't manage them. And this idea of having created for ourselves a possible destiny that is beyond our control is something that has been known for a, over a hundred years. And this is partly you know, my background in physics, but if you go back to 1903 with the beginnings of the scientific understanding of the instability of the atom and the possible release of atomic energy and radioactivity, in 1903, one of the early atomic scientists made this observation in a public lecture in London that if it could be tapped and controlled, atomic energy would become an agent in shaping the world's destiny. And what came to his mind in 1903, this agent that would shape the world's destiny was not an agent that would be a force for good, but that he says that the man who put his hand on the lever of atomic energy would possess a weapon by which he could destroy the earth if he chose. So this is a decade before World War I, but this idea that this new science and technology puts into the hands of human beings and their political institutions, a capacity not just to destroy cities or countries, but to destroy the world. So the world ending nature, of atomic energy and its potential in the hands of human beings and political agents um, has been around for a very long time. And Dan has helped kind of focus our attention on some key aspects of how this has come to pass and how it manifests itself. One of the things that the young Daniel Ellsberg you know, didn't know and that we now know and is just how political leaders at the highest level have thought about nuclear weapons. And we now know that in April of 1945, almost to the minute when the president of the United States, um, Harry Truman was told 
for the first time about the atomic bomb program. His secretary of war, what we would call the secretary of defense, came to see him and gave him a briefing about the almost completed Manhattan Project, the secret program to build the first nuclear weapon. And in his diary and in his memo, which is now available for everyone to read, the Secretary of War told the President of the United States that this weapon that is almost finished would be the most terrible weapon ever known in human history and that the world would be at the mercy of such a weapon and modern civilization might be completely destroyed. And so Truman did nothing to stop the weapon program having been presented by this judgment of the possibilities of what was at stake here. Instead, the United States went on and tested the first nuclear weapon in July of 1945, and then used it against Hiroshima in August of 1945, at which point President Truman noted in his diary that this is the greatest thing in history. And the United Nations that is founded at the end of World War II took upon itself as its first task the need for a plan for the elimination of nuclear weapons. At this time, the United States is the only country with nuclear weapons. And all it would have been required would be for the United States to make the decision to abandon its nuclear weapons program, dismantle the handful of nuclear weapons it has in a transparent and verifiable way, and begin a process of creating an international system for managing this new science and technology. And so resolution one of the United Nations called for a commission to make specific proposals for the elimination of nuclear weapons. This was the first agenda item of the United Nations. And Einstein and others tried in their own way to launch education and activism programs to deal with the threat of nuclear weapons, um, arguing that as citizens of a world community, we now share a common peril because of nuclear weapons. And in 1946, Einstein wrote a letter asking for a million dollars to support this new organization of, called the Emergency Committee of the Atomic Scientists to uh, provide the world an understanding of nuclear dangers and the urgent need to organize to end them. But it is this notion of a world community and of citizenship of a world community as a necessary approach to dealing with the threat that nuclear weapons posed that was a pivotal uh, perspective um, to go beyond the nation state and national leaders in dealing with this situation. And so um, the arms race begins as everyone knows, with the Soviet Union testing its first atomic bomb in 1949, and the US decision to pursue thermonuclear weapons, hydrogen bombs, which are now the cornerstone of the nuclear arsenals of um, modern uh, nuclear armed states, especially the United States, Russia, Britain, France, and China. And the scientists who had built the uh, atomic bomb for the United States actually urged their government the United States government, that even if it could build such thermonuclear weapons, hydrogen bombs, it should not do so. And the reasons they gave were this thermonuclear weapons would be a weapon of genocide because it carries even further than the atomic bomb itself, the policy of exterminating civilian populations. And this was their words in a secret report that they wrote to the US government in 1949. And that they said that the United States could actually chart a path to a different future by making clear that the United States, they said, in determining not to proceed to develop this new super bomb, the United States would have a unique opportunity to provide by example, some limitations on the totality of war and thus of limiting the fear and arousing the hopes of mankind. In other words, that by accepting a unilateral restraint on developing yet more terrible nuclear weapons. The United States had a second chance to try and begin a process to reduce the risk 
and consequences of nuclear war. Their advice was rejected and the United States tested its first nuclear weapon in 1952. It was 700 times more destructive energy than the Hiroshima bomb. The mushroom cloud was 30 miles high and 100 miles wide. And it was with these weapons and the combination of thermonuclear weapons and intercontinental ballistic missiles that finally that lever by which a man could destroy the world if he chose um, became real. And many of the newly independent countries um, from the European colonial empires um, recognize the urgency of the need to address nuclear dangers. And it's often forgotten that key leadership in thinking about and directing global attention towards the need for nuclear disarmament and how to frame nuclear disarmament as a collective responsibility and not just as a responsibility of the states with nuclear weapons comes from these post-colonial states. In the very famous Bandung conference, uh, the first conference of post-colonial states from Africa, Asia, and the Middle East in 1955, one of the key statements deals with the urgency of the need for a prohibition of the production, testing, and use of nuclear and thermonuclear weapons. And the formulation is because this is imperative to save humankind that the nations of Asia and Africa have a duty towards humanity and civilization to proclaim their support for disarmament. So even if they don't have the bomb, they have a collective responsibility to humankind to pursue this goal with all the means at their disposal. And similarly, Dr. King in the United States is making a similar case that the possibility of freedom and emancipation into the future for humankind means addressing atomic war, because otherwise our possibility to construct a human future is curtailed by this threat. And the emerging women's movement also takes on the urgency of nuclear weapons. And so one of the things that Daniel devotes his life to after 1961, um, in terms of his efforts within administrations in the United States, as he doc writes in his book, and then after leaving government and the release of the Pentagon Papers uh, as an activist outside was to deal with this question of how can we reduce the risk and consequences of nuclear war. He tried heroically to change US nuclear war plans and writes in his book about how he failed to make any significant difference in US nuclear war plans, despite his enormous access uh, to the highest levels of government uh, in the 1960s, and that um, in that sense, the capacity of institutions inside government to address the nuclear danger uh, was profoundly more limited than people imagine. And therefore, much more needed to be done from outside government as others had were also arguing at the same time. And at the same time as Daniel Ellsberg is in the Kennedy White House, the General Assembly of the United Nations passed a famous resolution saying that the use of th nuclear and thermonuclear weapons would be contrary to the rules of international law and to the laws of humanity. And the United States and its allies in Europe uh, voted against this resolution. And this resolution in my mind marks one of the key moments of the polarization of nuclear politics at the world level in this particular frame between the idea of the rules of international law and the laws of humanity and the idea of a global community and the role of majority and the democratic processes for making collective decisions versus the national interests of a handful of states and of the role of military alliances in managing uh, world order. So let me skip to um, this since I don't want to take up too much time. In 1968, Robert McNamara, who was Secretary of Defense at the time that uh, Dan was in the White House, made a now often overlooked speech about um, the nuclear age, in which McNamara said that the last 20 years, you know, basically since Hiroshima and then the, the nuclear arms race, that we have come to call this the atomic age. And he says, every future age of man will be an atomic. 
and that if humankind is to have a future at all, it will be a future overshadowed with the permanent possibility of thermonuclear holocaust. And about that fact, we are no longer free. And I would argue that Daniel Ellsberg's struggle since he came to terms with the existence of nuclear weapons has been to try and contest this claim that every future age will be overshadowed with the permanent possibility of thermonuclear holocaust and that there are many now um, uh, who have been engaged in exactly this effort as part of a collective effort at seeking freedom from this future. One of the things that Daniel has focused a lot of attention on in recent years in particular has been the fact that Modern science has begun to understand and explain the terrible consequences of nuclear war. And in terms of both immediate death of human beings, but also the catastrophic consequences for societies and of the planetary ecosystem on which uh, human society depends. And so he's focused a lot of time and effort in understanding and explaining to people uh, in his writings and talks, this idea of the current understanding of nuclear winter, how the smoke from burning cities uh, ignited by nuclear weapons would be lofted into the high into the atmosphere and would persist for a decade or more. And the darkness that would be created at the surface of the earth by this layer of smoke and soot in the atmosphere would cause uh, a catastrophic collapse in agriculture and natural ecosystems that rely on sunlight and uh, failure of regulation in terms of temperature and precipitation, um, meaning that there would be a dramatic drop in both uh, rainfall and temperature leading in some cases to temperatures below that of uh, the last ice age. And that the number of nuclear weapons it would take to trigger such catastrophic collapse is much smaller than had been imagined some decades ago. Because as our understanding of atmospheric physics and chemistry has increased with climate change models, uh, then we realize that the climate system is much more sensitive to these disruptions than had been previously understood. And so the recent understandings are that, you know, we would be uh, in a position where uh, it would take a decade or longer for temperatures uh, to recover. And certainly in the case of war between the United States and Russia with both of them possessing well over a thousand nuclear weapons ready to use, that billions of people would die as a consequence from the global collapse of food systems uh, and environments in this period. So in terms of to wrap up now, where are we now in the present threat? We know that in the context of the war in Ukraine, President Putin of Russia has threatened on more than one occasion um, the use of nuclear weapons. And the threats have been made with the same kind of ambiguity that has characterized the use of nuclear threats since President Truman made that very first nuclear threat in August 1945. Truman's formulation was a reign of ruin like the world has never been seen before. And President Putin talks about using all means at our disposal with everyone knowing and recognizing that Russia has nuclear weapons and there was a major Russian nuclear war exercise just before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. President Biden, for his part, has recognized publicly that even the ideas of a tactical nuclear war or the first use of tactical nuclear weapons uh, by Russia in the context of Ukraine leads to the possibility of escalation, which would end up with Armageddon. So the idea of limiting a nuclear war to the use of one or a handful of tactical nuclear weapons is not one that President Biden sees as being credible. Um, and we now know from US Strategic Command um, that in their own nuclear war exercises, that this escalation is actually something that they see and have no means to control. General John Hyten, the head of Strategic Command a few years ago in a public statement, described the global thunder nuclear war exercise uh, of Strategic Command. And I believe a new global thunder nuclear war exercise um, is upcoming. It's an annual exercise where they rehearse nuclear war. Uh, 
And General Hyten said publicly, and you can read the transcript of his remarks, he says, it ends the same way every time. Every time. It ends bad, and the bad meaning it ends with global nuclear war. And General Hyten went on to say that they cannot find at Strategic Command a way to get off the process of escalation where one weapon leads to more weapons, leads to more weapons, leads to more weapons until there is all out nuclear war. And that they have failed to find a means to provide uh, an off ramp from the escalatory process. At the same time as a recognition that nuclear war planning cannot control itself and that it leads to Armageddon, the United States and the other nuclear weapon states, there are only nine, are all committing to continuous processes of modernizing and advancing their nuclear arsenals. The US plan about which we know the most, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, anticipates spending over $1.5 trillion of the next 30 years on new nuclear warheads, new missiles, new planes, new submarines. Many of these systems will be not in deployment for 20 or 30 more years yet, and will be in service almost until the end of the 21st century. The military officers that will be responsible for managing these airplanes, submarines, and missiles have not been born yet. But the systems that they will be responsible for, the United States is already making commitments to the production of those systems. And the arms control processes of treaties and agreements of various kinds so painfully and agreed with such difficulty during the Cold War have all started to unravel. As many of you know, uh, the anti-ballistic missile treaty of 1972 was considered by many people to be the foundation of arms control because it accepted the policy of restraint that you would restrain even your own defense against nuclear weapons because the pursuit of a defense would lead the other side to build more nuclear weapons and lead to an arms race. And the United States became the first country ever to withdraw from a nuclear arms control treaty in 2002 when the Bush administration withdrew. And the reason given for this withdrawal a decade after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War was that times have changed. In other words, in a new geopolitical reality, there was no reason for the United States to accept this kind of restraint on itself. And other treaties that were agreed also have been withdrawn from both by the United States and by Russia. And the last remaining treaty, the New START Treaty agreed uh, under President Obama in uh, 2010 uh, will expire in February of 2026. And that will end agreed limits on the number of deployed strategic nuclear weapons. So the flip side of all of this is this effort by everybody else to try and pursue nuclear disarmament uh, from the ground up, even though they have no nuclear weapons. And there is a network of nuclear weapon free zones around the world uh, with more than 100 countries as members, which is more than half of all the countries in the world who have agreed among themselves not to have nuclear weapons um, or to possess nuclear weapons or to allow nuclear weapons to be stationed on their territory because they have pursued the vision proposed by Alvar Myrdal, the Swedish diplomat in the 1970s, that we should not be submissive and limit our efforts to what we can do only when the superpowers agree among themselves. Myrdal argued that lesser states should be prepared prepared to proceed on their own. We cannot leave the world hostage to the symmetry of great powers and their national interests and their domestic political processes and institutions. And the nuclear weapon free zone treaties are one aspect. And the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons is the other aspect of this, where um, in 2017, 122 countries agreed um, the text of a treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons. It is a comprehensive prohibition and not only to develop, test, produce, manufacture, acquire, or possess nuclear weapons, it prohibits the use and the threat of use of nuclear weapons. In that it prohibits reliance on nuclear deterrence, the threat of use of nuclear weapons as an instrument of national policy. 
and it requires states to uh, eliminate their nuclear weapon programs and facilities through a verifiable time-bound plan. Now, I want to be clear here that the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons was agreed among non-weapon states. The nuclear weapon states refused to be party to these negotiations and have tried to prevent progress on treaty negotiations and implementation. Under the Trump administration, the United States wrote a letter to all the signatories of the treaty, urging them to unsign the treaty. That just the existence of this treaty in and of itself and the idea of having parties to this treaty was something the United States at that time would not accept. But the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons does not necessarily require that each nuclear weapon state just give up its nuclear weapons and join the treaty. It allows for nuclear weapon states to agree among themselves through a process of negotiation, means to join the treaty where the Treaty of the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons provides an architecture and goalposts for arms control negotiations among nuclear armed states. The treaty says these are the obligations that we believe are appropriate and that we have accepted. These could be the obligations that you seek to agree in negotiations among yourself and that you agree and propose plans for the elimination of your nuclear weapon programs and facilities through a verifiable time bound plan that you believe is appropriate among yourselves because that is a requirement of our treaty. And once you have agreed all these things, then you can bilaterally, multilaterally, or all together join our treaty. Um, and we would then all be bound by the same architecture of a nuclear disarmament set of obligations. So the treaty allows for this framework approach where the nuclear armed states could negotiate paths to entry among themselves, where they accept the obligations as the goals for their negotiations. Um, in the same way that the United Nations resolutions in the past have often set goals for negotiations. So the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons can be seen as a setting of goals for nuclear weapon states for their negotiations to pursue nuclear disarmament. So with that, I'll stop and welcome comments from Richard and others in our conversation. Thank you, Zia. A very comprehensive presentation and uh, you've raised a number of very important issues which I'm sure others would like to reflect upon. Thank you, Zia. Now, before I invite uh, Richard, to respond to the presentation and also raise other points which he feels uh, are important. Could I draw your attention to just two issues that came up in Zia's presentation? These are important in terms of the quest for a nuclear weapons free world, a quest for a world that is uh, committed to peace and harmony amongst nations and peoples. Number one, uh, Zia had referred to the Pentagon Papers in the course of his presentation. What is significant about the Pentagon Papers and the role that Dan played, that Daniel Ellsberg played when he revealed those papers, it's the impact it had upon subsequent developments, especially the Vietnam War and also the impact upon the position of uh, Richard Nixon as US president. Eventually, what Dan had done, revealing the Pentagon Papers, and others had done, that reinforced that particular type of uh, atmosphere, it led to the impeachment of Richard Nixon, which is very, very significant in terms of uh, the ability of people, of uh, citizens to speak to power and the consequences emanating from that impeachment. So that's something which we would want to reflect upon, the importance of speaking truth to power, even if you don't see 
uh, the light at the end of the tunnel, eventually you'll find the changes do emerge, which you may not even be able to anticipate. The second point I wanted to make was uh, in relation to the Bandung Conference, something that's very close to the heart of many of us. As I had talked about uh, the Bandung principles, the Bandung principles are very, very important. It's a pity that we haven't given enough attention to it, and even those countries that were very prominent in the struggle for the Bandung principles, they have more or less uh, pushed aside those principles. But I think this is what future generations will have to give serious attention to, the significance of the Bandung principles, the 10 Bandung principles in the spirit of Bandung. They are closely related to many of the things that are happening now. The whole question of sovereignty, the question of uh, disarmament, the question of uh, a different way of looking at interstate relations and so on. That's something which uh, I think uh, activists and uh, intellectuals should be focusing upon in the future. Just these two points for your reflection. May I now, with great pleasure, invite Richard Falk to make his presentation. Richard, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chandra. Uh, and I want to uh, start by saying that um, I think we've been privileged to hear uh, Zia's uh, brilliant uh, account, both in terms of how Ellsberg influenced the way we understand the nuclear danger and uh, the broader uh, questions of how how much the uh, constituted authorities the elected leaders of the most proud democratic countries uh, have contributed to the entrenching of nuclearism in such ways that make it uh, so uh, difficult to challenge effectively. And while celebrating uh, the achievements of Dan, one of the uh, one of his achievements is the acknowledgement, as Zia pointed out, uh, that even someone with his extraordinary intelligence, access, and commitment had no influence on the way in which public policy in relation to this uh, infernal weaponry was being shaped by the political leaders. And this kind of pessimism from an insider who dissented from the premises that gave us uh, un, uh, unnecessary and unlawful wars. Pentagon Papers, of course, was a response to the Vietnam War, uh, not to the uh, nuclear danger, and uh, issued these uh, statements of which lacked any kind of empathy for the billions of people exposed, despite their innocence, to the most horrible kinds of death. Uh, uh, in other words, that pessimism about the established order addressing this problem uh, seems to me to be one of the important contributions. And it poses a challenge and an opportunity combined with the responsibility of civil society to mobilize and act. And 
and we initiated shape in that spirit that we couldn't really rely on the constituted leadership or the institutions that exist in order to address these uh, primordial challenges. And uh, Zia mentioned in passing uh, that it was very difficult to establish a, an effective consensus in favor of denuclearization without the existence of a world community, which implies shared values of a degree that really doesn't exist. We live in a state-centric world, and it's dominated by three or four states that, that are explicitly self-excluded from adherence to international law. And the, we have to face the fact that the UN was designed to be weak. The only organ it possesses with authority, with, uh, which combines authority with opinion, is the Security Council, and the, the five most dangerous countries after World War II were given a veto power. And that veto power is the equivalent of saying, the Charter doesn't apply to us if we don't want it to. Our strategic interests are more uh, important must be uh, insulated from the primacy of international law. And that, that was quite a, a, a radical recognition of the primacy of geopolitics when it came to war, peace, and global security issues. It wasn't entirely without a uh, justification, because the League of Nations seems to have collapsed after it was established in the wake of World War I, uh, because it excluded geopolitics. And Franklin Roosevelt, the wartime president of the United States, uh, firmly believed that these countries that had cooperated in defeating fascism would cooperate in preserving the peace after 1945, after the guns fell silent. That, of course, was naive and uh, didn't reckon for the special interests that were associated with maintaining the war system and uh, exaggerating threats to security in order to justify uh, arms uh, races and threat, coercive diplomacy, and the pursuit of geopolitical ambition. And we're now living, and in the wake of the collapse, the implosion of the Soviet Union, with a situation in which a, a, a geopolitical vacuum existed in the early 1990s that created the opportunity for the United States to project itself as the sole power entitled to use force outside its boundaries. And this, in, in effect, what I've called a Monroe Doctrine for the world. And, and uh, that's what, in my view, is the geopolitical dimension of the Ukraine war, where uh, Russia and indirectly China are seeking uh, realignment 
geopolitical realignment to the extent of the respect for their uh, traditional spheres of influence. And those spheres of influence are what prevented World War III. Uh, in Europe, uh, the tolerance of Soviet hegemony in East Europe and Western hegemony in West Europe was respected despite being under severe tension at times during the Soviet interventions and some of the covert activities uh, in the West European countries, they were strictly respected and had been planned as, as secure geopolitical fault line. So I think that's a very important aspect of the world situation that we are dependent really for a effective anti-nuclear movement to come from below. It's There have been decades of opportunity to come from above and there have been minor advances or, or let's say, risk reduction elements along the way, but nothing uh, dramatic. And the, I suppose the most eloquent confirmation of this point is the enforcement of the NPT Treaty non-proliferation treaty so far as non-nuclear states are concerned, but the absolute non-implementation of Article 6, which requires good faith efforts to achieve nuclear disarmament, and which I've heard uh, American security elites talk of as a no more than a useful fiction in order to uh, bind the non-nuclear states to a, a, a fake bargain, in effect. So I think there are many reasons uh, to heed uh, the messages that have been delivered by uh, Dan Ellsberg, and by Zia today, and to realize uh, that we are faced with a situation where we have no reason to trust uh, the political leaders governing the use of these weapons to protect us uh, in the future, and that it is up to the peoples of the world and what allies they can find in the mainly in the global south to challenge this form of hegemony let me stop there if i may which has made some uh, salient points and uh, these are also points which we would want to continue to reflect upon. It's very important to a movement like uh, SHAPE because uh, it is a call. It is a clarion call to people to work together, to mobilize, to set the agenda, because you can't expect the sort of changes we want to see to come from the elites, from that stratum of society which controls people. It has to come from uh, ordinary men and women who are committed to a certain vision, who are committed to certain goals. This is a message that we have heard over and over again, a message that resonates with our own work and with our struggle. We will now take some questions. And uh, my colleague, uh, Hassan Al, has been looking at the question answer box and uh, there are some questions that have come up question initially meant for dan elsberg uh, 
the doomsday machine, his book. In that book, you write in the early chapter about your trip visiting US military bases in the Pacific in uh, 1950. And your concerns that in certain circumstances, American pilots or other nuclear command authorities might not follow clearly defined procedures and orders. Do you see any similar dangers in the 1920s, given inter alia the many uncertainties surrounding the war between Russia on the one hand and Ukraine and uh, NATO on the other? This is a question that was meant for Dan. I'm just wondering whether Richard or Zia would like to respond. Zia, would you like to respond? To also refer to the Doomsday Machine. Um, I'm happy to. Uh, yeah, please. Add a reflection uh, to that. And, you know, perhaps Richard has uh, additional thoughts. So when um, Dan Ellsberg was. Uh, going to various US bases to look at how actually nuclear weapons were being managed on the ground um, in potential theaters of future conflict. Um, he did discover that the assumptions that were commonplace uh, about how only the president could authorize the use of nuclear weapons. That that in fact was not the way that actual command structures and practices had been put in place. And he explained what he had found uh, upon his return. And others also came to similar conclusions and that various measures were then subsequently, technological measures were put in place to begin to address that set of concerns, including the use of uh, specific codes uh, to unlock and authorize the use of nuclear weapons. And so there is a distinction to be drawn between um, the ability to authorize the use of nuclear weapons as imagined as a political decision and the practice of authorization that uh, takes place. And one illustration that uh, adds to Dan's experience um, from some years later was revealed by um, a colleague of ours at Princeton, who many of you may know, the late Bruce Blair, who early in his life had been a US nuclear missile launch officer and was very involved later on in understanding and explaining the challenges and contradictions of US command and control um, of nuclear weapons. And he reported that uh, these codes that had been introduced to try and make sure that um, officers um, wouldn't be able to launch nuclear weapons uh, by themselves without presidential authorization, that these codes were in fact installed, including at nuclear missile launch sites where he had worked, but that the US Air Force um, had been so concerned that the launch officers would put in the wrong code and therefore the missile might not launch when they were ordered to launch it, that they set all the codes to zeros. So there would be six digit codes and only the president was supposed to authorize what that code was. And so that would be the code you would enter to launch the missile. And the Air Force said, yes, we have a system of switches and codes, but all the codes were set to zero, 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 zero. So that the chance of error would be as little as possible. And so the confidence in launching would be as mm -hmm. high as possible. And the, the Secretary of Defense and the political leadership were not told that the codes that were installed on their orders had actually been circumvented in effect by this mechanism. And then Bruce Blair reports that when he informed Robert McNamara many years later, who had ordered these codes to be installed, that this is in fact what had happened. McNamara was furious. <laughs> 
And it is commonplace that institutions that are given orders to do things, when those orders begin to conflict with other institutional necessities and cultures and plans and procedures, then certain kinds of contradictions are put into place. And the issue of the command and control and authorization of nuclear weapons has constantly suffered from the tension between the need for centralizing control to authorize the use of nuclear weapons at the highest levels of political leadership in the handful of states that have these weapons, but at the same time, the need for those weapons to be secure and survivable even in case of the nuclear attack where your leadership may no longer be alive anymore and in a position to authorize the use of their national nuclear weapons. And so there are these contradictions about always being able to use nuclear weapons and making sure that nuclear weapons are never used incorrectly. And this is an irresolvable contradiction at one level. And so states with nuclear weapons have constantly struggled institutionally, technologically, and politically with this kind of structural problem of having nuclear weapons and how they are to be used. Thank you very much yeah, for a very interesting response. Richard? Uh, yes, I, I have nothing to really add to what uh, uh, Zia so uh, lucidly uh, told us, uh, but I just want, it, it made me think of my early uh, contact with Dan when we were both uh, students at uh, Harvard. And Dan at that time was a brilliant advocate of strategic thinking. You know, and the, the, it's relevant because it shows how a person who has a underlying moral integrity can can be totally transformed through uh, contact with the existential realities of what he earlier professed. And when I, uh, we were not uh, at all uh, uh, on the same page when we knew each other at Harvard in that, that time, I'm probably the only one around uh, that was uh, uh, also present back then. And uh, Dan was a very vigorous advocate of this kind of strategic thinking as part of uh, legitimate national security. And it, it was in that spirit that he joined Rand, joined the US government, and then began the process of trans of transformation and disillusionment uh, that has characterized the bulk of his life and why we are celebrating that life in today and uh, forevermore. Thanks, Richard. Shall we go on to the next question uh, from one of our Registrants, uh, Linda Fox, Hunter Peace Group Australia. What does the panel think about the ACUS PAC and uh, Australia? Something missing there. ACUS PAC. Oh, the ACUS PAC and Australia. Uh, sorry, I'll just say again, uh, which in large part turns Australia into a nuclear friendly country mm. by agreeing to purchase and possibly build nuclear powered subs and agreeing to birthing of UK and US nuclear subs. Okay, you've got the question. It was not you know, clear, but now Asandal has you know, gone through it again. Someone would like to answer that, you know. Perhaps. Uh, Joe may want to respond to that question too. I mean, let's see what uh, Zia and Richard have to say. Uh, I don't feel confident to answer that question, really. I think Joe should be given an yeah. opportunity. Yeah, it's about the echo. So Joe, would you like to say something? Uh, 
this. Are you there, Jill? You know, I've just unmuted myself. But yes, uh -huh. uh, Chandra. Well, <clears throat> at AUKUS uh, and Australia's role in it uh, needs to be placed in the wider context. Mm -hmm. uh, what the United States uh, has for some years now been very keen to establish is a kind of decentralized NATO in the Asia Pacific region. And there are many elements to it, many, many elements. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are bilateral alliances, US Japan, US South Korea, uh, US Philippines, uh, and of course, Australia. Uh, some of them are multilateral uh, structures that are in the making, of which AUKUS, uh, Australia, UK, <clears throat> US is, is another. And um, <clears throat> so the important uh, underlying objective uh, is to transform what we've known as the Atlantic Alliance, NATO, into a global uh, complex, multifaceted structure uh, that brings fully uh, Asia Pacific into its ambit. And uh, Australia is playing a key role. That's why, for example, uh, so much uh, emphasis has been placed both by the United States and Australia in having Australia attend uh, uh, NATO summits, uh, which has been a recent development. So yes, that is the case. And what Australian governments have done has been to, if, you're not, if you like, meekly, but I should say enthusiastically, support that overarching strategy and to become increasingly integrated into uh, US strategic interests and priorities. That's the sad state of affairs so far as Australia is concerned, uh, despite the deep misgivings of many of its uh, Southeast Asian and Pacific neighbors, uh, which it claims to be uh, uh, very strongly engaged with, but which in practice uh, around these questions, uh, they are, uh, of course, far apart. Thanks, Joe. Actually, this is a major issue which concerns uh, a lot of us, the way in which um, NATO is uh, being transformed, if you like, and, and uh, the attempt to get Asia Pacific into this uh, network. And it's something very, very serious. I think the latest is uh, the moves made by the Philippines, which is going to cul culminate in this meeting between uh, the Philippine president and the US president. And I think there'll be an attempt to sort of draw one or two Southeast Asian nations into that uh, framework. Very important, the points you've made, uh, Joe. Let's move to a couple of other questions. I think that oh, has- Linda, been... If I might, um, yeah. I, I, I just wanted to add a small uh, note yeah. to um, Joe's very important remarks, if I can. And that is that, um, this Australia, US, UK agreement on the provision of nuclear submarines um, follows from a prior effort and agreement between France and Australia for the provision of non-nuclear submarines. Um, and France had been willing to provide nuclear submarines to Australia, but the concern was that the US would restrict it. Um, at the same time, this process of alliance building and coalition building by the United States and its NATO allies and projecting that practice into uh, the Pacific um, and including Australia more dramatically and directly into those military plans and infrastructure for the use of US and NATO military forces uh, with the stationing of US aircraft and possibly submarines and other military forces in uh, Australia so that there would be less time required to be able to uh, move forces into theater. At the same time, uh, it's worth keeping in mind that there is debate within Australia 
about Australia's role and future in this set of processes. And I draw attention particularly to the fact that under the new Labour government in Australia, um, the Labour Party in Australia actually made a commitment uh, before coming into government in support of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Australia is a signatory of the South Pacific Nuclear Weapon Free Zone, the Treaty of Rarotonga. But in particular, Australia has made a statement, including by the current Prime Minister, Albanese, in support of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And Australia was one of the very few countries with direct military ties to the United States that was an observer at the first meeting of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons as an observer state. And that was only because of this change in government within Australia. And so I think that there is room in Australia for intervention and progressive political forces to do work on um, engaging in democratic processes in Australia, not just on um, this militarization of Australia's role in the Pacific and in the world order as it emerges, but also on these questions like the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons and so on. And so, all of these kinds of political interventions are by nature uncertain, but there is room and scope and some precedent and potential support for opening a debate about how this is to go forward and how much of it can be turned back or moved into a different direction. So I think that uh, the continuing role of Australia in this process is still something that I think um, both colleagues in Australia and from around the world can make common cause in trying to see what kinds of democratic interventions are possible. All is not lost yet. Could I allow Joe to make a quick comment, Joe? Because I think it is something that you have worked on. Want to well, some of you may know, and perhaps others don't, um, as it turns out, uh, if you're looking at mainstream media, uh, the powerful media chains, uh, there is no question that they are wholeheartedly in favor of the progressive integration of Australia uh, into uh, US military interests and strategies. Um, and by and large, I think I have to say, uh, the Labour government has been prepared uh, to swim with that tide. Right. And it's taken a former Prime Minister of Australia, a Labour Prime Minister, Prime Minister Keating, uh, to call the whole thing into question and uh, to launch uh, a very strong attack against the government in general uh, and its foreign and defence ministers in particular, because... Uh, one has been ineffective and the other one has been enthusiastic supporter of these war making plans. That's the reality. And it's a moot point as to whether the present term of office, which has two years to run, uh, will end uh, with any effective signature, let alone ratification of the treaty for the on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. One hopes that they might move in this direction. But of course, there is another danger that they may add their signature and then refuse to do anything about the range of nuclear entanglements uh, that Australia has with the United States. And that would be uh, to invite the legitimate criticism of wholesale hypocrisy and bring, in fact, the treaty into disrepute. That is to say, a signature on Australia's part would become only meaningful if it were to involve a serious redirection of a whole range of military entanglements uh, that presently uh, tie Australia to the United States, including, of course, um, uh, the presence of one of the most important bases of its installations of its kind, uh, the one at Pine Gap in Central Australia. Uh, but quite apart from that, Australia has never said uh, officially that it does not wish uh, to be defended or supported by the nuclear deterrent. 
And it seems to me that a signature of the treaty would be virtually meaningless unless you renounce on that uh, com implied commitment that you wish to have the benefit of nuclear deterrence. So there would have to be an awful lot of work that would need to be done to accompany uh, uh, a possible signature of the treaty for that signature to carry real meaning. So whether we're likely to see that commitment, there would have to be a mass mobilization in Australia, uh, and uh, there might be the beginnings of it, uh, but some long way to go. Thank you, Joe. I would like to take a couple of other questions, because we have still got a bit of time, I think. You know? This is a question from Maja Aga, initiator of uh, Iran Nonviolence Group. To what extent the mutual need of the regimes ruling Iran and Israel as ex existential enemies increase the chance of a nuclear war in the Middle East? It's uh, a little clumsy in terms of its wording, but I think it's clear. The chances of a nuclear war in the Middle East, given the positions of these two adversaries, and this is what the person is asking. Would someone like to respond? Uh, either, yes, uh, Zia or Richard, like to respond to that? Uh, well, I can say a few words um, yes. about it. Yes, I think uh, I think that the situation of tension and ideological fervor in the way in which Israel and Iran are interacting does uh, suggest that uh, some kind of effort either to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons or Iran feeling that it's sufficiently threatened that it must acquire them and that out of those uncertainties could easily spiral an escalation uh, of such a sort that it would end in some kind of use of nuclear weapons. Uh, let me, while I am talking, say one thing about the earlier conversation about uh, the effect of the AUKUS uh, treaty and the NATO of the Pacific, uh, one thing to think about is that this is directed at China as part of a uh, rebirth of the containment geopolitics that was so characteristic of the Cold War was George Kennan's a doctrinal idea initially. And it seems to me that in the altered conditions of the Pacific, uh, what the U.S. has been trying to do is to uh, set up a containment uh, system uh, directed particularly at the defense of Taiwan, but also uh, a way of establishing that China has no basis for extending its uh, diplomatic and political control beyond its present borders. And it's, it's really part of this effort by the U.S. after the Cold War to be the only effective hegemonic actor in global political space. The questions, which uh, we may want to take, there's a question from someone called Cheryl Spencer, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and it's specifically to Dr. Mian, Zia Mian. Now we have the US government saying that China is an enemy, we should be prepared to fight, and it's more or less in line with 
the answer that Richard had given just now, sounds like an excuse for the weapons manufacturers to make more weapons and more profits. Dr. Mian, tell us how you see this recent addition of China to countries the US needs to worry about. Thank you. Mian? The first thing I would say, if I can, is that um, it's not clear to me that this is as the question posed, uh, a recent phenomenon. Um, this concern about China. Um, it's worth remembering that um, it was in 1992 that, as Richard alluded to with the end of the Cold War, that the United States focused its attention on future geopolitical order. And there was a very famous defense guidance that was leaked um, at that time, um, authored by Paul Wolfowitz, among others, which said that the primary purpose of US foreign policy must be to prevent the rise of even a regional competitor because a regional competitor able to mobilize resources from in a region in the world may at some stage begin to pose a global problem for the United States. And it wasn't clear then with the Soviet Union having recently collapsed, who might be a candidate for such a global, a regional competitor, but people went looking. And if you recall, it was actually in March of 2000 that President Clinton made a famous visit to India, two years after the nuclear weapon tests of 1998 by India and Pakistan. It was the first visit by an American president for quite a long time. And he spoke in the Indian parliament about the imperative of the United States and India being strategic partners in uh, managing peace and security in Asia. And it was interpreted by many at that time that this was the beginnings of a US effort to recruit India into a policy of containment against China because the sanctions that had been imposed on India for its nuclear weapon tests were all lifted at that time. And three years later, under a Republican administration in 2003, we had the US-India nuclear deal which was widely understood to be aimed at giving India the technological capacities in nuclear and space technologies and dual use technologies, which were the components of the larger agreement that was made to build India as a counterweight to China. And so this idea that this confrontation with China is a recent phenomenon, I think misses these precedents and processes of building capacity in various ways. Um, that uh, are not always successful, but you can actually see them playing out um, at that time and subsequently. The second part of it is that um, it's often the case that one ascribes this power to the military industrial complex, but I draw your attention to a very interesting speech that President Biden gave um, not so long ago, uh, which was not very widely reported in which President Biden talked about China as a potential mortal competitor. A mortal competitor, his words, for the United States. And he went on to say that even if the United States recognizes that there are common existential challenges like climate change that face the United States and China together, that may not be enough to deal with this mortal competition that they may be entering into. And the reason he gave for this mortal competition was the rise of China. He says, I've met Xi Jinping so many times, I know him, he wants to rule the world, basically. Hmm. And so this is a way of thinking that goes far beyond the kind of mundane interests of capital within military industrial complexes or institutions. This is what, the great sociologist 
um, Norbert Elias called hegemonic intoxication on both sides, not just that of President Biden, but also Xi Jinping. This excitement that takes over existing and would-be hegemons that goes beyond the specifics of the kind of rational calculus of institutional interests when we talk about uh, the military industrial complex and so on. Certainly there are interests in the military industrial complex, but there are countervailing interests of large sections of American capitalism on access to China's suppliers, labor force, markets. American capitalism made vast amounts of money from this cooperation with China. And so they do constitute a countervailing interest within the political economy. And so it's not all one way in this, but there is this other factor that we should not miss out, which is the fact that, you know, leadership can matter, especially in times of crisis. And we do get these particular notions that surface sometimes in how leaders think about these kinds of things. Thank you, Luzia. I would like to combine a couple of questions. There is a question that uh, alludes the recent Schiller Institute conference, which called for an end to geopolitics of the type that prevails at the moment and the new security and development architecture for the benefit of uh, the people as a whole. So someone wanted a response to that, what one thought of this uh, call from the Schiller Institute. And at the same time, there's this question that asks, how do you engage young people in the struggle to abolish nuclear weapons? How do we galvanize concern among those under 40? These are separate questions, but you know, we can try to combine them, I suppose, in the interest of time. Would uh, someone like to respond, Zia or Richard? Uh, Richard? Uh, I'll start off. Um... Uh, as far as the uh, call by the Schiller Institute is concerned, uh, it's not enough to uh, uh, engage in some sort of rhetorical uh, exercise. One needs a strategy to address the present problems that are so urgent in concrete terms and and although we've devoted uh, a lot of attention in this webinar to understanding what the uh, fundamental nature of the nuclear danger is uh, we also should be uh, aware and alert to the fact that there are things that can be done uh, by people now to reduce those risks and including uh, a uh, grassroots type of organizing the, the ambitions of a group initiative like shape to question the whole assumptions of uh, geopolitics geopolitics i mean to call for an end to geopolitics without having the means to uh get there how do how do you how do you achieve this is it seems to me almost a recipe for despair uh and and it requires a movement that is global in scope and uh deeply committed to a transformative politics and that's what i think civil society requires the imaginative uh, potential to generate but it will require the commitment of people all over the world to take seriously how dangerous this present situation is. Thanks, uh, Richard. So Chandra, if I just might add, add a footnote yeah. to Richard's comment, I mean, I, I, I agree with everything that he just said. 
I, I think that we should keep in mind that one lesson that history can teach us, I believe, is that at times of crisis, and especially times of hegemonic transition, um, there are, as uh, you know, people have written before, morbid symptoms that appear, you know, to borrow Gramsci's formulation. But it is also an opportunity for a disciplined utopianism to explore the limits and understand the limits of the old order and the possibilities of imagining without those limits being overwhelmingly a constraint. And so I think the challenge here is that when one imagines ending geopolitics, geopolitics is like saying that you want, ending geopolitics is like saying you want to end politics. It's not a practical, meaningful proposition since we live in human communities. It's just a question of what kind of politics do we want? What kind of geopolitics do we want? And who are the agents and actors and interests and goals of this geopolitics? And where does this geopolitics live institutionally and culturally and socially? And so I think here the, the question is to be asked whether through these practices that Richard is talking about, um, of building movements that address actually existing circumstances, we can begin to prefigure some of those answers that we seek in our practice and in our thinking, rather than just make menus for a future with no means of actually having a kitchen that can prepare anything. <laughs> and so I think that the, the issue is to actually discipline our utopianism with practical political work and recognizing that we are doing experiments in practical politics where we cast our understanding of ourselves and the world against the actually existing struggles and see what we can do and be willing to be humble and to learn from what does not work and what that experience teaches us and to keep trying. And that's as much as that we can hope to do given the limits of where we are in the situation. But I think that um, we do need to be much more practical in thinking about where we are and what capacities we have. And in terms of movements, and especially the second part of your question about young people, I would suggest that we actually have two movements right now that are very evident and visible on two leading existential issues of our time, which is climate change and nuclear weapons, which are organized by and led by very young people. The climate change movement is overwhelmingly young and the key organizational structure behind the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons in the civil society space was ICANN, an organization founded in Australia just over a decade ago in the mid 2000s. And so I think that um, and they already have a Nobel Peace Prize and the membership and the activist base they have is very, very young. So I think it's not a case of how do we do this? People are already doing it. The question is, what is our relationship to those efforts in terms of thinking with them theoretically and working with them practically? Uh, can I just add Thank one? Thank you. Yes, Richard. Uh, yes, I think uh, what uh, Zia just said is uh, essential to an appropriate understanding and practice. Uh, but I want to say that there was one meaning for the call for an end to geopolitics that does have potential concreteness and practical political relevance, and that is to end this uh, impunity that attaches to the behavior of these dominant states, a call for accountability under international law seems, for all states uh, seems to me to be important. And we, we should remember that even after uh, World War II at Nuremberg and Tokyo, the crimes of the victors were not examined or punished. And that's not a legal system where you only look at what the losers have done. And that's carried forward in the veto and this whole idea that there are certain uh, powerful states that should be given an exemption from 
uh, the obligation to uphold international law. Well, I have to bring this session, the question answer part of it to an end very quickly. There are two questions and uh, it's repetitive in a sense, but on the other hand, I think uh, these are things that we may want to focus on. One, how effective is the ethical power of uh, the global South, the nuclear dis disarmament, given the fact, and this is why I think it has got a different uh, dimension to it, given the fact that two countries in the global South also rely on nuclear weapons in their defense strategy. Zia, a very quick answer, please. Yes, I, so I, I think that the global South is not just a geographical category. It's a political project. And you have to remember the similarly that with the non-aligned movement uh, for much of its history after the Bandung conference, um, as has been pointed out, you know, there were contradictions within it. India, which was central to the non-aligned effort for decades, right, not only went on to have nuclear weapons, but you know, has made various alliances um, for various purposes. And so one has to ask the question that when we speak about the global south, then we have to ask the question, you know, what is it that we're trying to mean by this? And it's not a developmental category in this context. It's not a geographical category in this context. In the context of nuclear weapons issues and so on, you can see that there are a large number of countries in the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons who are also members of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. There's a statement by 145 nations at the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty conference uh, in uh, 2022, um, clearly stating an opposition to uh, the threat and use of nuclear weapons under any circumstances. And so the idea of countervailing institutional power of countervailing communities is I think a more appropriate way to think about this rather than to limit ourselves to an imagination that says, well, the global South is basically poor countries as if there were a political block on all issues. Because I don't think that necessarily gets us very far. Um, and so, and it's, an, it's a, the global South as happened with developing countries in the third world uh, as a concept in the Cold War, you know, has its internal cleavages and contradictions. And so we have to think about it in terms of political currents and political processes and political commitments rather than necessarily these broad categories. Thanks, Zia. Now the last question in our session, the Q&A session, because it's directed at me and it is something which we may want to think about, I should respond to this question. I don't know who the questioner is, but he asks, or she asks, what is my opinion on Malaysia and Singapore, because I'm from Malaysia, who are members of the Five Power Defence Arrangement of 1971, with UK, New Zealand, and Australia being drawn into the Australian commitment to become part of the US nuclear network? I think that's a very interesting question. Well, let me state this because uh, this is something that we have alluded to and Joe in particular alluded to this in his answer earlier on to one of the questions. I think it is very, very important for us to keep in mind that within ASEAN, and this includes Malaysia and Singapore, there's a great deal of uneasiness about Australia's relationship with the US on this particular question the nuclear network, about the submarines, about uh, you know, the way in which Australia is moving in that direction. It's in the media, it's also amongst politicians on both sides of the divide in Malaysia, for instance. And even in Singapore, there has been concern within some of its think tanks. So I don't think one will be able to get away with this very easily. Don't forget that uh, this attempt to get countries in ASEAN to align themselves more closely with the US has not worked. 
so far. Because I think within ASEAN, there is a certain notion of uh, being independent, of uh, maintaining their sovereignty, of not getting um, drawn into this conflict between uh, the US and China. And many of the ASEAN countries, at the end of the day, they are close to China, mainly because of economic reasons, but also because of historical reasons that a lot of people are not aware of. So I think it's not going to be that easy for people to draw ASEAN states into the Australian nuclear network, as you put it. Okay, that's um, I think about all. We have covered about seven or eight questions now, I think, in this General. session, yeah. And uh, there would be other questions, I think, that we, there may be other questions we haven't attended to, but I would like to suggest that since uh, Shape has got its own uh, website, if there are these questions and some of you feel that these questions are very, very important, please uh, redirect them to SHAPE and we will try to answer them uh, through our website. Some of these questions, there'll be one way of engaging and carrying on the dialogue. The website has just come on and this is something which I think is important. And that brings me to the last uh, segment of our webinar today. And this is, uh, the closing remarks from one of our conveners, three conveners, you know, Richard Forbes, Joe Camilleri and myself, as far as Sheikh is concerned. Joe Camilleri, uh, Professor Emeritus at La Trobe University and uh, an expert on international relations, he looked a great deal on issues that concern all of us. He will now uh, take the floor and uh, I hope uh, he will address some of the issues that we were not able to address in the course of the last so many minutes. The floor is yours, Joe. Uh, thank you very much, Chandra. Just a couple of uh, brief observations and then a word about uh, the SHAPE project. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, the point I would very much like to stress is that the, start, uh, the task before us is of course political, it's in part cultural, it's certainly ecological and economic. Uh, no question about that. Uh, and, uh, but first and foremost, I think it is ethical. The challenge before us is an ethical one. And uh, if I may just uh, develop that uh, obs observation, if I may. We are facing a number of, uh, as is now, well stated, a number of existential challenges. Two, of course, immediately come to mind, climate change, the danger of nuclear war. They're obvious, but there are others too. Uh, it, it may well be that in the next, over the next 10, 15 years, we will see a series of pandemics, both uh, uh, re, uh, revisiting of some existing ones and some new ones, some new ones. Uh, for uh, close to a billion or perhaps close, uh, more than that, uh, the existential threat, uh, uh, the existential possibility of death from unnatural causes is a pressing one uh, as we speak. Uh, and uh, many more. And the point about all these is that I think they are interconnected. And if there is one important aspect of what SHAPE is interested in, it's precisely to make the connections uh, between these uh, multiple challenges we face, whether we put the word existential in front of them or not. And though they all have political, cultural, ecological, economic uh, dimensions, I think fundamentally the change is an ethical one. And that I think was, uh, Quite clear, came quite clearly across <clears throat> in, <clears throat> excuse me, in Zia's in, initial comments. What do I mean by ethical? <clears throat> well, it's not just that there is a potential loss of uh, life, of injury to <clears throat> both life and planet, and that that would be, uh, and that is something that touches us. <clears throat> Uh, but what is in question now, I think, as never before in human history, 
is that is the question about what is the human species. Does it have a mission? Does it have, um, is it on a journey where it is called upon to establish its ethical credentials? its credentials as an ethically driven species or not. And th that fundamental sense, uh, to fail to act now in the current circumstances, knowing all that we do, is to say, to answer that question in the negative. And to answer that question in the negative is to demean and demote what humanity is meant to stand for, and therefore to call into question what it is that each person is a member of. So it, it goes to the heart of the most profound question, who are we and what am I? And to answer that question profoundly is the existential question that I think everyone, every human being is called upon to deal with. Now, how do we respond to this ethical challenge? Uh, well, I think the first thing to say about that, um, and uh, I pose the question in a slide, is that it calls for sacrifice. It calls for sacrifice uh, because uh, it's not enough, as Edward Snowden so graphically put it in his recent book, it's not enough to stand, to, I'm sorry, it's not enough to believe in something. Uh, it's, not an, it's not enough to say, I don't support nuclear weapons. Most surveys would tell us in, that in most countries, opposition to the, uh, not just use, but even acquisition or possession of nuclear weapons is quite overwhelming. 60, 70, 80%, in some places close to 90%. The question is not just what do I believe in, in a kind of intellectual sense. It is, uh, what do I stand for? And what do I stand for poses the question, what am I willing to sacrifice? Or to put it more accurately, what are we willing to sacrifice? And basically the answer is very straightforward. Uh, what are we willing to sacrifice? What do we need to sacrifice? What we need to sacrifice is energy. And clearly there has been, if you compare to the enormous outpouring of energy in, past, in the past around major issues, the Vietnam War, the anti-apartheid struggle, and uh, uh, the enormous energies and uh, engagement worldwide, uh, that helped to bring the, the Cold War to an end. Uh, we need that kind of energy on a global scale and uh, with a clear sense of the interconnection of the issues we're confronting. Climate change, uh, economic uncertainty, crisis, financial crises, the nuclear issue, the militarization of our politics, uh, the progressive and highly visible decline of so-called democratic politics. They're all interconnected. Uh, this requires energy, uh, enormous energy, intellectual energy, emotional energy has to be come to the surface collectively, not just on an individual basis. So energy, intellectual and emotional and moral, ethical. The, the next thing, of course, we need, we need is time. Uh, the energy cannot be done, uh, cannot be released, cannot be demonstrated in a moment, a fleeting moment here and there. It has to devote time. We have to reorganize our time budgets uh, to bring them up to speed, so to speak, in a way that can effectively respond uh, to the existential challenges we currently face. How we use every minute of the day has to be rethought uh, and uh, appropriate priorities established in time. We have to give time 
uh, a lot more time than is present to the case. And thirdly, we may need to give something of our material resources uh, to, in response to the challenge, uh, whether it be assets of various kinds, uh, money, whatever it may be. So energy, time, and material resources need to be brought into play on a bigger scale than perhaps ever before in pursuit, in response to the ethical challenge we currently face. And um, in, in, in a sense, this is uh, what shapes task is. Highly ambitious in one sense, uh, very specific and concrete in another. We want to draw attention to the ethical, uh, to the ethical challenge humanity faces at this time. And we want to emphasize two points. Uh, that issue, crises, uh, don't stand alone. They are interconnected. And uh, therefore, the task must be to connect issues and to connect people and to do it across national, cultural, and civilizational divides that currently exist. Uh, a big task, you might say, uh, but one must make a beginning. So SHAPE is an ambitious and modest, uh, if you like, project uh, that has that as the backdrop. So if I may, just by way of concluding, uh, bring uh, to your attention uh, what SHAPE is doing, and more importantly, what it hopes to do. So first of all, let me take you, uh, and Ben will help us with this, uh, to go to, um, our website. Uh, is that what you're going to do, Ben? I hope. Yes. So here is the SHAPE website. Uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the URL is very simple, the shapeproject.com. And there you will see uh, already uh, the events we've already had, of which the, this is the third major one, the latest event. Uh, you will have, you will see a blog which has some very interesting contributions from a range of people. And uh, I want to bring to your attention now uh, the crowdfunding appeal, uh, uh, which I will do in just a moment, but firstly, the call. Uh, so if we can go to the call, and the page, which was launched in some months ago now, uh, in the second part of last year. Uh, and uh, what that does is respond primarily as a launching pad to the crisis in Ukraine and the situation uh, in the Asia Pacific region, the US China contest uh, and the flashpoint Taiwan. It starts there, but goes much beyond it. And as you can see, we have close to four and a half thousand endorsements. Uh, we are very keen to reach the 5,000 mark. So you can easily uh, go to change.org and invite your network of people, not just yourself, uh, if you haven't already done it, uh, to consider uh, endorsement of the call. Uh, and uh, once we get to the 5,000 mark, we will want to, to um, bring that to the attention of many people, the implications of the call, uh, the proposals it makes, and see whether we it can get, gain some traction. But before we do that, uh, we would like to get at least to the 5,000 mark, which is close, uh, but uh, more work to do. Of course, if we get to 6,000, that's even better. So that's an invitation. The second invitation is uh, we need a small sum of money to get our act together. Small to begin with, larger as time goes by, and that's why we have launched uh, recently a crowdfunding appeal uh, that uh, Ben will now show us. It's called Restore Hope, Saving Humanity and Planet Earth. As you can see, we've just uh, had some 60 odd donations already with uh, approaching the $5,000 mark, uh, and we are keen to at least bring it to the 12,000 mark uh, over the next month or five weeks. So if uh, you can part with uh, 
a small fraction of your material assets and can contribute to the crowdfunding appeal, we would be immensely grateful. Uh, we are in the process of setting up an international consultative council, uh, which will be intercultural and of course international, and uh, to uh, in including many of those who were the initial endorsers of, uh, of the call, the call uh, to all who care about humanities and the planet's future. And we hope within the next week or two to announce the membership of the Consultative Council, which is meant to assist uh, in shaping some future activities and uh, major initiatives we have in mind not just future webinars, but a series of proposals and uh, an attempt to connect with a wide range of organizations uh, beavering away on the range of issues, uh, including, of course, the very important one we've been discussing today, uh, the rising danger of nuclear war. So this is an attempt, to, if you like, uh, to connect, to connect issues, to connect people, to connect people across cultural, political, uh, civilizational divides, which is uh, uh, at the heart of the uh, predicament we presently face, and to come around to some sharper definition of the ethical cha challenges we now face and the ethical responses uh, that are well overdue, and that hopefully humanity will be able uh, to uh, undertake uh, in the months and years ahead. Shape an ambitious but humble uh, contribution uh, to what uh, desperately needs to be done now and in the foreseeable future. Thank you, Chandra. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Well, it remains for me to just say thank you to everyone. Um, uh, to thank, of course, uh, our two main speakers, uh, in particular to Zia Mian, who's, uh, who very kindly and graciously stepped in with uh, uh, Dan Ellsberg's uh, unfortunate uh, illness at this time. We wish him the very best in the time ahead and, of course, his family. So thank you very much to Zia for insights and information, which I know was widely appreciated. And similarly to Richard, uh, our other co-convener, uh, thank you for all the energy and uh, the learning and uh, uh, the uh, moral exhortation that you brought uh, this today uh, to this webinar. And of course, to Chandra, uh, for his uh, wonderful moderation and um, the very substantial contribution he's making to this project. And finally, to all those who've participated, to those who have asked questions, uh, who have made comments, who have expressed their good wishes, we are all deeply indebted to you and we hope to remain in close touch. Everyone who has registered, not just those who attended, but we had well over 800 registrations, will receive uh, soon uh, the recording of uh, this uh, webinar and with further information about uh, of the SHAPE project and uh, possibilities and as well as questions and invitations to you to express your views, uh, share your concerns and some of the activities that you're engaged in. So with that, I wish everyone the very best in all our collective endeavors and hope that they will be equal to the task before us. Thank you.